As much as we and our plants and flowers love the sunshine, there are times and places it's not very abundant. That's why we really appreciate plants that grow in the shade. We'll share some of our favorites coming right up. Once the plant is infected, there really isn't anything you can do about it. The, the root flare is right along here, so we want to make sure that's below ground level. Watermelons, musk melons. This is a yellow or gray cone flower. This one's called uh, Picasso in pink. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening, I'm Pamela Fish. We've titled this week's program Shady Business, but there's really nothing dubious about hostas and other shade-loving plants. They are highly valued, as are our garden experts who join us each week. They are, of course, Tom Casper, the president of Duluth Garden Flower Society, and Bob Olin, horticulturist and garden educator. Welcome back, gentlemen. Well, thank you. Great to be here. Mm -hmm. Talking and, garden. And we're, welcome springtime. That's Hopefully, right. Finally. Welcome to the spring. <laughs> All right. We also want to welcome our dedicated phone volunteers who are here from the Duluth Garden Flower Society Zenith Diggers Club. Please give them a call with your questions about hostas, shade plants, or any garden issues that come to mind. There's the number on your screen, 218-788-2844, or there's a toll-free number you can call, 1-877-307-8762, and we'll have those numbers up throughout the show. Also, you can email your questions during this program, too. Ask Great, ask great Gardening at WDSE. Dot org. So send them in however you can get those questions here. One of the questions um, I have right now, with the conditions that uh, some of us think are unfavorable, <laughs> uh, are we that far behind with the growing season? No, I don't really think so. No, and, and the, the real great thing about this spring is that we've had plenty of moisture. And we really didn't have as much frost in the ground, so a lot of this has really been absorbed. We didn't have as much runoff right. as I'd anticipated. So actually, we're, we're in good shape, but... Uh, the calendar is advancing and people should be alert to that and should think about really getting moving here pretty quickly. The calendar is advancing. I like that. Oh, did that. I say that? Uh, <laughs> yes. No, he said advancing. Oh, advancing. <laughs> I thought he said advancing. <laughs> Getting a little older. But I, but I like the thought of the calendar like dancing. The dancing. <laughs> Moving things right pretty, along. A little too creative for me. I'm sorry, Tom. Oh, let's have some fun. All right. Well, we are going to have a little fun tonight. And uh, we are going to talk about hostas because the hosta is a well-loved plant for many reasons. Hardiness, ease of care, and, of course, its appearance. One gardener in Superior takes her love of hostas to a whole new level with literally hundreds of different cultivars. I'm Jean Levikowski. You're in the East End of Superior, and welcome to my yard. I've been here 20 plus years in this in this home, and uh, I just started gardening probably because my father and family was farmers, and this is my way of farming. <laughs> it's I've been doing it for 30 plus years, and then I just went with uh, daylilies and hostas and bee balm and stuff that you know is pretty hardy for this area. The daylilies. Believe it or not, I over half of them I traded through the internet. There are several sites that you can trade on. And the other, I buy a few locally, and the rest come from co-ops. Any type of lily, <laughs> day lily, Asiatic, uh, Oriental. <laughs> There's no such thing as having too many lilies. Or hostas, or peonies. <laughs> sedums, I like to use the low covering, the ground covering sedums. I, I don't know, I just like them. They, they're easy to grow. I don't like uh, the, the bark and stuff because I, I just have issues with it. So ground covers help keep the moisture, moisture in and the weeds down to some extent. My stepfather, uh -huh. he made both this wagon and that wagon over there. And I just have a thing for rocks, so <laughs> I've been dragging them home for, for years. The other little odd things I put in the garden gives you something to look at in the early spring and you have some interest in the winter. They're all maples except for the one there and that one. Uh, there's massive tree roots there. Actually this whole front this whole front area is massive tree roots. This one here is called Titanic. It's only been in the ground. Um, I do believe this is his third summer and it should get quite huge. This one here, this one here. 
If they look like they're suffering in the tree roots, I will pick them up. I will, you know, move them to a place that is less infested with the tree roots. Yeah, I have, last count was several years ago, it's around 100, 350, I'm guessing probably maybe 400 now. They're all over the whole yard in different places. They grow well, you put them in the ground and pretty much you water them and you ignore them. They do their own thing. You know, they're very, very hardy plants. They come in all different sizes, all different colors, you know, in shades of green and blue, cream and white, different mixtures, leaf textures. They're, some of them are very delicate leafed and some are very thick. They, they're, just, they're just beautiful. <laughs> They get anywhere from tiny, tiny to monstrous. That wind chime my husband made for me. He made the bottle trees too. Gazing ball stands, he's made, he made those too. A little more interest, you know, a little, because it's just a sea of green that gives it a little color, pulls your eye to it, so. And Lord, you have to have a spot for the hostas. <laughs> Buy the plants, worry about where you're putting them later. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's how morph gardens get dug in the yard oh where am I gonna put this hmm there's some grass that needs to go there's always room for more gardens I as long as I have grass there's more room for gardens well we like Jean's attitude yeah. don't we <laughs> wow. yeah yeah always more room for hostas yeah. and you can't have too many lilies and we of course were lucky enough to tour her garden on our bus tour yeah, last and summer. And a couple other varieties for folks to look for if they're looking uh -huh. for the giant hostas. We've talked about Empress Wu before. Right. It's about four by four. Mm -hmm. um, another great one is Humpback Whale and Komodo Dragon. If folks look for any of those three, if they can find them locally, they're the biggest of the big hostas. So. And they do get huge, but it takes them a few seasons, is yeah, that right? Yeah, probably about five seasons for, for them to get mature size okay. of that three by three or four by four. So. But they'll get big, they even will. in this neck of the woods. All yeah. right, on to some questions from viewers. Eric from Esco says, how can I use a large amount of leaf mold in my vegetable and flower beds, and will it have to be amended in any way? You know, I really think so. It, by leaf mold, he's probably just talking about partially decomposed uh, leaves from broadleaf trees and so forth, uh, rather than fully decomposed compost. The big issue there is going to be uh, the need for additional nitrogen from some source. And if you don't add uh, a real soluble form, such as a synthetic nitrogen, uh, it may tie up nitrogen in the soil in the early part of the season. So you could use organic or you could use a a granular form, but for the early part of the season, using some granular nitrogen to help break down that compost farther, and then it, it's just a good soil amendment. I want to follow up because I had an emailed question last week from Kathy in Duluth, and she was wondering if it would be all right not to take the leaves off her garden and leave them on there for mulch. It's actually a good idea, uh, as long as she's not suppressing anything that's going to emerge. Uh, actually, because once again, there you probably wouldn't want to add the additional nitrogen. You'd want it to break down. A mulch, you'd like to keep it on the soil, where a compost, you want it to break down and work into the soil as an amendment. So yes, break it away, use it in the aisles, help suppress the weeds, and uh, don't apply any additional nitrogen at that point. Let it stay intact. And it right. also reduces the need for watering as well, so it's going to cut down on our need for watering. Great. Right. So. Keep those leaves. Okay. Yeah. Well, we just talked about how you can't have too many lilies. Becky in Virginia thinks you can have too many lilies. <laughs> she wants to know, what's the easiest way to get rid of tiger lilies? Should I cover or dig them? And they are in clay. Yeah, they're pretty easy to dig out. Mm -hmm. They stay in a very nice, compact, uh, clump form of roots, easy enough to pop out with a shovel. Even if it's been there a long time, she can dig those out pretty easily. So I'd do it that way rather than spraying or covering. So. And Tom, they divide so nicely. And believe it or not, there's some people that don't have enough That's lilies. That's right. So give them to your neighbors <laughs> yeah. and spread but the those, dry. But those tiger lilies do spread out. Yep. Yes, they yeah. do. Mm -hmm. But they can be moved just about any time. So that, that can yeah. be a little bit uh, later in your priority list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Andy from Carlton wants to know how to keep sap suckers off the crab apple trees. Ooh, there we go. Well, sap sucker is not a woodpecker, although it's about the same size. They are actually small migratory bird that actually sucks the sap out of that, that tree, and they can be quite damaging. You usually see a series of perforations or holes, and usually you'll see one series and they won't complete the job. So once you've seen a series of holes, you want to protect that, and with something that's uh, permeable to air, something like burlap, you can wrap it, or maybe uh, something like a hardware hard cloth, cloth, collar, yep. something like that, mm -hmm. or a screen, 
uh, to prevent them from returning and doing some significant damage. Yeah, over many years, they can actually destroy the tree if they keep returning mm, to sure, it. So. Sure, and they just uh, love to dig it with whatever is inside. Well, they're actually consuming the sap, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's a food source for them. Unlike a woodpecker that's actually going to be going after insects, insects that are in there. Sure. But they're actually consuming and, and living on the, the sugar that's in that sap. Mm, okay. All right. Well, uh, Shirley from Normana says, I have a raised bed on the east side of the garage. Does it have enough sun for strawberries? And if so, do I need to improve the bed there? It's a good question. Uh, Any time that you've got a fruiting plant, you need at least six, seven hours of sun. So she'd have to tell us how much sun that she's actually getting. If she's not getting that, she's going to get some nice foliage, and it'll probably impact uh, her yields overall. If she has enough sun, yes, uh, strawberries are not, not real heavy feeders. She wants just a good, well-drained soil. They don't like heavy clays, so any kind of organic material she can add or raising the bed to improve the drainage. That's what's really important with strawberries. Okay. Well, it's gonna be interesting to see how our strawberry crops have survived mm. because we didn't have snow cover till later after we had some of these uh, colder temperatures. So I'm not sure what Bob has seen uh, with some of his growers, but it'd be interesting because we went really went through December and the snow didn't start till after the first That's of the year. Right. So You're absolutely right, we had 20 below. I would have loved some of that April snow back in yeah. late November, or early December. Uh, I am seeing garlic crops that aren't coming through, and I'm seeing some other difficulties. So if, if this is that year that you lost some material, you know, you've just got some open space you can till up, and you can plant a new annual Start crop this year. <laughs> Put something else there. Okay, Janet in Duluth wants to know how early she should cut her rose bushes. Probably can start doing that right now. Now, if she's going to want to do a rejuvenating prune, she can cut them right to the ground right now. Mm. If she just wants to do a trimming, what she should do is wait to see some of the buds start to swell or start to form. And then prune, uh, if she wants to clean it up, prune so all the buds are facing to the outside so you get nice open growth habit. Uh, and probably do that in the next week to 10 days, hopefully. So, Does it matter if you do the rejuvenating one? I, I've, I've done that before. Does Will it um, stunt the growth a little bit? Well, it's going to set it, it back, obviously. But it, it certainly isn't going to hurt them. Most mm -hmm. shrub roses will respond very well to that and okay. still bloom for you this year. So, All right, great. Uh, Joanne and Duluth, how early should I apply preen to my shrubbery? You know, that is a very good question because uh, preen is a uh, pre-emerge herbicide, so it prevents weed seeds from germinating. But if you were to apply it right now because soil temperatures are very, very cool, mm -hmm. it'll just break down and, it, and the, the seed isn't even germinating. So she's going to want to wait probably until the second week in May would be a good time to uh, make an application. And Which then, is next week, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Gee, that came fast. It's yes, next week. yes. <laughs> and assuming we're getting, going to get some warm weather, yeah. we are in a warming trend. So she wants to wait a little longer yet for okay. that. Yep. All right. Well, we're going to have to hold off on the questions for a little bit. We have a lot of them coming in, and we'll, we'll get to them as, as best we can. But right now, we want to talk more about hostas and other shade-loving perennials. Tom shares with us the qualities of some varieties and how to care for them. Northeastern Minnesota has a lot of trees, so we have a lot of shade. So finding plants like hostas or some of the other ones that we have listed, um, it's a great way to garden in those shady locations. Hostas will also tolerate not the greatest soil conditions. So um, you can put them in areas underneath mature trees, tucking them into places and stuff like that, and they'll do pretty well for you. The other great thing about them is there's thousands of varieties. We've mentioned a few of well over 5,000 varieties of hosta that are available. So um, really the sky's the limit and the, uh, the opportunity to enjoy them at whatever level you want. It's one of the great things about hosta is the diversity within the, the plant population is really outstanding. I've taken what was the beginnings of many plants and now um, have divided that up and, and putting that into containers. So. In just a matter of a few minutes, um, we can take what we've divided, adding it to containers, firmly placing it, and we have three additions to the garden where we began with just one. These can go out as, as soon as we're probably maybe the third week of May, so coming up pretty quickly. Hostas, like a lot of our other perennials, will tolerate some cold, so as long as it's not damaging cold, they're going to be okay. So these could start um, out and even if you wanted to, bringing them in and out of your garage to acclimate them for a few days prior to planting, 
would be a good thing. If you can amend the soil, it's obviously be best, especially when you start dealing with some of the other plants besides hostas. Uh, Regersia, uh, Ligularia, some of the other ones, Estrangia, those kinds of things really like a better soil and really don't like a lot of direct sun. So look for those shady spots. If they are in a sunny location, make sure it's an east location where they're getting morning sun. Afternoon sun is oftentimes too strong for them. A lot of the shade loving plants will tolerate a little bit of additional moisture. You don't want it soggy or, or boggy, but they'll tolerate a little, uh, a little bit moisture in the soil. So you can use some of those areas in your garden, um, plant them a little high if you're concerned, um, but things like Ligularia actually prefer a damper condition. So amend the soil if you can, improve it, uh, plant the appropriate plant depending on the shade and the location of where the sun comes from, and you should have great success with your shade gardens. A lot of good information. One of the things we did talk about, Tom, when we were uh, taping that was, what about deer? And we got a question <laughs> from Richard in the city of Duluth, because I know you chuckled a little when we asked you that, because there are so many options and they're not all successful, but um, Richard wants to know, how do I protect those hosta from the deer? Now, there's gonna be a variant opinion. <laughs> eight foot fence. <laughs> Not quite with hostas, but. Yeah, who needs to put <laughs> up a fence with hostas? I try everything to protect my hostas. I well, just and there's those douse sprays, them. you know, yeah. that, that work and are, they really are about taste and odor. And we've talked about sprinklers that I use that are very effective. There's different sorts of LED lights that mm -hmm. also work where they emulate um, a predator's eyes that uh, frighten deer. So there's lots of different products, including fencing, depending on what you want to do. So. Mm -hmm. You know, what we have seen, Tom, is we've seen, and these are very small beds, and you, you know, the smaller the bed, more confining the bed, the shorter the fence can be. And I've actually seen monofilament line, heavy monofilament line stretched uh, three or four feet high, and that tends to uh, repel them in small areas. They obviously yep. could reach in and could cross, but there are some options, but uh, the, the option is, that doesn't exist is to do nothing because they uh, deer do love hostas. They love, love the hostas. Yeah. They're very hungry. Almost, they, probably more than we love them. Yeah, right. They, <laughs> and, I, and I really think they've had a tougher winter than we have. If that's hard to believe, yeah. and they're very hungry right now, so we're seeing a lot of uh, damage occurring at this point. Yeah. I was going to ask: Is now a good time to be out there spraying uh, the buds of the rhododendron, the azaleas, and so forth? Sure. Yeah. And and we're it, depending on location, we're starting to see some plants coming up, mm -hmm. and those are the tenderest and the most desirable for deer. So getting out right. and spraying them now and putting stuff down is important, so. Okay, lots of questions to get to. Let's get started. Bill in Duluth has a seven foot arborvitae in a 12 by 14 pot, uh, clay-like soil. He's wondering when he plants it, should it stay in the potting soil or in other soil? Yeah, he can pretty much plant it as is. And speaking of plants that deer love, he's gonna have to do things mm. in the winter to protect that as well, so. Okay. What he probably doesn't wanna do though, he sounds like he's going into clay and this is a, uh, a container grown uh, tree that he's dealing right. with there, is he really doesn't want to dig that hole and just fill it with another soil. He wants to try to open up that clay and integrate uh, some organic material across a broad area that these roots can extend into rather than digging this this uh, teapot kind of effect that'll hold water. Okay. So he wants to open it up and he wants to incorporate organic while he's doing it and then he should be just fine. So maybe right. one and a half times the size of the container so there's a little space on the sides yeah. for it to. Okay, Ray in Duluth <clears throat> has a 10 year old Herald Red. Uh, the last couple of years it had has blisters on it. Do we know what that might be? Boy, I wish I knew if he was talking about on the bark or on the actual apple itself. Mm. But on, on the bark, it, it <laughs> certainly could be um, uh, sun scald would be the first thing that you would think of, particularly if it's oriented on the south side and that's wrapping in the fall with some kind of a craft paper tree wrap or the easiest thing to do is actually spraying a latex paint and I'll qualify this for folks because you really need to, you can buy a cheap latex paint, white in color so it reflects mm -hmm. the, the sun's ray, but you've got to use an interior. You can't use a real permanent exterior paint or you'll actually you know, clog <laughs> the the pores of the, the tree. So it started to look it, like a fence it'll post. For 30, you have a white tree for 30 years. You don't want that either. So an okay. application, one or two years of a very inexpensive interior, interior paint. white latex paint. Okay. Sharon Superior has a pot of omithagalum. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. It has orange flowers. The leaves look like tulips. And it says, put it in a nice sunny room, but can she put it outside? Yeah, they're a bulb. 
She can plant it out as soon as uh, it's warm enough. It's not going to, of course, bloom again this year. Um, so it's going to recharge over the summer, die down, and then bloom for next year. Do we know the common name of that, for those of us who don't uh, recognize this? Star of Bethlehem. Okay, okay, great, thanks. Linda in Duluth has a Jack Manny clematis that's three years old and wants to know if she should cut it back or not. It's a very common uh, clematis, and uh, this is one that's going to bloom on new wood. So uh, those buds will be formed uh, this growing season. So you can cut that pretty much right to the ground and let it go yep. and uh, encourage it to, uh, to develop, and it should be just fine. Betty and Ely, where can I get a do-it-yourself soil test kit? You know, those are relatively mm. available mail order. Many, okay. many uh, seed catalogs, if you work your way back into the uh, catalog, you'll find them. The question is, do you really want to purchase something like yeah, that? Yeah, how accurate are they? How accurate they are. They're, they're based on chemical reagents that uh, aren't as accurate as you'd really like. So I would start at least with one good professional soil test mm -hmm. done by a certified lab, and then you could augment that maybe with some pH testing and other things from a kit. But I really yeah. think your money is better spent on a, on a real quality sample test taken at a certified lab. And, and they're really not much difference in price. Really. No, and, and you can be confident of the reliability. Yeah. Look, for a certified soil testing lab, certainly University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin would be the easiest options for most people. Okay, let's see if we can get through just a couple more here. When should I use weed and feed and uh, some suggestions for lawn care? That's from Marion in Duluth. Uh, weed and feed after things are actively growing, so probably at least another two to three weeks before your grass is greened up and the weeds are actively growing is the best time to use it. So. All right. And a fall application is actually even better. So. And remember, with that kind of a product, it goes on when the leaf surface is wet, so right after rain, or if we, if we hit a dry spell, which we're due for, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to water the lawn first so there's water droplets on the leaf so that the uh, herbicide granules actually adhere to the, uh, the surface of the weed. A, uh, a straight fertilizer goes on prior to a rain, a weed and feed type of product goes on after the rain has been completed and while the leaf surface is still wet. And definitely do it while the lawn is growing rather than now. I see folks out in the past have fertilized before their lawn is even greened up and then it's just getting into our water system. So. All right. Uh, Stan in Chisholm wants to know, should he put wood stove ashes on his vegetable garden? Ooh, there's a real good question. You never apply a wood ash unless you've taken a soil sample and got the test results that indicates the need for lime because it's, oh, okay. it's a liming agent and you can get into more trouble than what you really bargained for. If it calls for an ag lime, then you can actually substitute wood ash for that liming product. All right. Well, a lot of good questions, a lot of great answers, but we're, uh, we need to stop there because we want to talk a little bit more about shade plants and just like some sunny spots in your yard, the shade garden could sometimes use additional bursts of color and flair. Shade annuals can provide that, and here are a few you might want to try. In, the, in this area, we have uh, prim primarily plants that are, are happier in the shade, and one of the newer things are these uh, begonias with big leaves, and they often are termed dragon wing begonias. Um, they kind of they kind of have that that shape, um, and they are uh, lots of blooms and uh, great colors, and and often uh, uh, really pretty foliage to go with them. So that's kind of the the new thing in begonias. They're much bigger than than the typical begonia that you would have. Um, seen uh, from years ago, they have big, these big shiny leaves and lots of flowers and, and um, they're quite, quite tough. Another um, area where they're developing a lot of new varieties are in the coleus. And they're coming out with a lot of different colors, a little different texture, a lot of different sizes. So you can see in here there's quite a variety. Um, this one's called uh, marooned, this nice, nice purple color. Um, there's one called, oh, this one's called Honeycrisp, which is more of a golden color with uh, red streaks on it. Um, this one's called Alligator Tears, um, the green with the white variegation on it. So those are, there's, there are often uh, a lot of new coleus that are coming out that are um, really interesting and nice, nice background plants. And they're called spreading impatience in that they make a mound rather than um, kind of grow, grow up more straight like the typical garden impatience does. So. We're an All-America trial garden site, and so we have a lot of plant material um, that's gone through that process as well as plant material from other growers that they're testing here to see what's suitable for our, our growing conditions during the summer. They gave us a great tour up there in Grand Rapids, and you're familiar with Pat and their work up there. Yeah, they do a real nice job. The North Central 
Research and Outreach Center, mm -hmm. open to the public at any time, and they do have a horticultural night. It's always the, the last Wednesday evening in, in August. August. Yes. Okay, and now hopefully some of us can make it up there. Well, if you're not seeing buds and blooms yet in your garden, there are the pictures from last year. Here's this week's Grow and Show. From the gardens of Nancy and Don Larson in Washburn, Wisconsin, a shock of Rudbeckia, or Black-Eyed Susan, welcomes summer visitors to their home. Nearby, the clematis weaves its vines and blossoms through a walkway railing. The Larson's West Highland Terrier, Scuffy, likes flowers too, and welcoming friends to the family's front door. In springtime, they anxiously await the stunning display of their crab apple tree as it bursts forth in vivid bloom and share with us the beauty of their bearded iris in shades of deepest purple and palest pink. If you have garden photos to share, please send them by email to greatgardening at wdse.org or mail them to us at 632 Niagara Court, Duluth, Minnesota, 55811. And we do want to tell you about a couple of upcoming events. There's going to be a spring luncheon. Uh, Tom, you're involved in that? Yes, yeah, we have Melinda Myers coming up from Milwaukee. She's a nationally known uh, author. She has about 30 books on gardening. She's coming up May 11th to do a presentation on garden makeover. It's going to be a lot of fun. And Bob, you're going on a peat tour. Yeah, we want to invite the public. Got a few spots left on the bus. We're going to take you out and show you the peat industry first, how those bogs get formed and then take you through a processing plant and stop at our good friends Burns so people can do some shopping along the way. There you go. Check our website for more on that and more information uh, on upcoming garden happenings. And also we want to remind you to check that too if you can join us on our Bayfield and Madeline Island spring bus tour. Well that's all the time we have right now. Please get out to your local greenhouses and nurseries. Also opening day for the Duluth Farmers Market this Saturday from all of us here. Thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.